now we come to the um, uh, main lecture of the evening. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to introduce my colleague, Malcolm Longair. Uh, we're both in the Department of Physics, um, uh, which, uh, which of course famously, um, uh, has, it was the place that uh, the structure of DNA was um, discovered. Um, of course, it later migrated down to the LMB, but it did start in physics. Uh, as did many other things. And Malcolm um, has a wonderful um, um, a wonderful career that spans many things, but one of the things that Malcolm has done rather brilliantly in, in recent years has to be is as a sort of historian of um, how science is done. Uh, Malcolm produced a wonderful uh, history of the Cavendish Laboratory, which was uh, much needed and much appreciated by uh, all of us. And part of the story of the Cavendish Laboratory is, of course, um, what what happened um, with the story of the double helix. And uh, this evening's lecture, Malcolm, is sort of we we nudged you, uh, having noticed that you had been writing um, on that topic. Um, and your title is "The Unsung Heroes of the Discovery of the Double Helix." So, thank you very much for coming to speak to us. Mm. Well, good evening. Can you all hear me clearly? Good. <clears throat> I may move around, which will cause a fluctuations in noise level, but there we are. Richard knows that. So that's just my usual thing. Well, it's a great pleasure again. <laughs> that's it. Well, it's a great pleasure to lecture yet again to the, to, to the Society for the Application of Research. I've done it several times before. Uh, as uh, Richard implied, I was sort of my arm was twisted to give this lecture, which I now do with extreme pleasure, uh, because I learned a lot that I didn't know before. And in particular, the story I'm going to tell you is the background of what was happening in the Cavendish and all the key players, many more than the ones who are very well known. You know, Rosalind Flankard, Blake Watson, Wilkins. These are what you, but these are simply the tip of the iceberg. And underneath that, there's a huge range of physics that actually contribute to this, how things were discovered. And that's what we're going to do this evening. Now, let me indicate instantly that I am not a molecular biologist. I am not a, bio, a physics or biologist. I am simply a common or garden astrophysicist cosmologist. That's where we're starting from. So uh, let, let, let's see what we're going to do this evening. So we're going to uh, do, do the following. Uh, it's the background to the, the this discovery of the uh, of the double helix, and I'm going to do it in the following way. It's really part of the evolution of the Cavendish Laboratory from a nuclear physics laboratory to a multidisciplinary physics laboratory as we know them, as we know know it today. So I'm going to show that transition in three three separate bits. The first two go very very quickly. The golden years of discovery from the discovery of the electron, 1897, until the golden year of 1932. Then we have the years of decline, when the Cavendish went through really something which could have totally destroyed it. And that was the years of decline between 1932 and 1939. And then we've got the years of regeneration from 1945 to 1972. And many different activities contributed to the ultimate success of Watson and Crick. Well, let's do the 20th century trance. Do this very quickly in three slides. Here's what here are the, some of the big things everybody knows about. We boast about all the time and say how wonderful, how wonderful it all was. We've got we got the electron uh, being discovered. Let me see. Does this work? Sorry, gone. I'm going too fast. That. Uh, that actually shows up. Yes, we've got the discovery of the electron in 1897 by J.J. Thompson. We've got the invention of the cloud chain by C.T.R. Wilson in 1912. We've got Lawrence Bragg and his father discovering the law of X-ray diffraction in 1913. We've got Charles Aston and his mass spectrograph from 1913 onwards. And then we've got uh, Rutherford and nuclear transformations. He did most of his great work when he was not in Cambridge, but he came back to Cambridge and did the wonderful work on the nuclear transmutations. And then 
on this slide, finally, we've got Patrick Blackett, who invented the automatic cloud chamber and photographed nuclear disintegrations in 1928. The last of these historic slides here, here's James Chatwig and the discovery of the neutron, 1932, and then Cockroft and Walton doing the first artificial disintegration of nuclei and providing the first genuine experimental evidence for Einstein's formula E equals mc squared. The great paper happened in 1905, but the actual demonstration that all the energy is added up according to E equals mc squared was only shown by the Cockroft and Walton experiment. So that's where we were. So if we look at the staff and student research rooms in June 1932, here they are. These photographs, we've got them on the wall in the Cavendish, and we try to photograph everyone who is a graduate student, postdoc, or staff member. And it's not too bad. I reckon we get around about 50, 60, 70 percent of all the staff there. Well, anyway, here's the 1932 picture, and uh, an awful lot of these people got the Nobel Prize. So we, we, we just show them all with their Nobel Prizes. And there they are. There, 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 there are nine of them. And uh, we, we've got here, we've got uh, Cockroft, Blackett, Aston, C.T.L. Wilson, uh, Rutherford, Tom, Thompson, uh, Chadwick. Kapitza and, uh, and, and uh, Walton. So it, it was a pretty good year uh, for, 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 for getting Nobel Prizes. Now, uh, at that point, then things started to go not so well. This is the decline and exodus part of the history of the laboratory. So Rutherford was very lucky to seek the resources to continue the development of research in nuclear physics. He liked the machines that he could build and do the experiments with machines which could only get up to around about 200 keV. And he could do fantastic stuff that way. But that was not where the great discoveries were going to come from. That was going to be going to higher energies, more powerful machines. 1932, Chadwick recommended the construction of a high tension laboratory, but Rutherford was against it. Chadwick decided there was no future for nuclear physics in Cambridge. Cockroft tried to persuade Rutherford to allow him and his colleagues to go ahead and construct a cyclotron, which was the way to the future, but no, Rutherford was disinclined to go ahead with that approach. So it meant for the next three years or so, there was the, the key years when other groups were building cyclotrons and powerful accelerators, it was basically static in Cambridge. So that's where the accidents happened. Blackett went to the professorship of physics at Birkbeck in 1933, then Manchester and Imperial College. Chadwick went to Liverpool in 1935. Ellis went to the Wheatstone Chair of Physics at King's College London. And at the outbreak of the Second World War, Cockroft was appointed an ADR in the Ministry of Supply. Walton became a fellow at Trinity College Dublin in 1934, and then as Erasmus Smith's Professor of Natural and Experimental Philosophy in 1946. It goes on. Wynn Williams, the person who invented the scale of two counter, which was the first digital counter system, he became a lecturer in, in uh, Imperial College. Oliphant, who was again doing excellent work, he became assistant at Birmingham and then professor, pointing professor of physics in 1937. Kapitza was detained in Moscow in 1934 and not returned to the laboratory, and CTR Wilson re retired. So it was um, a Pretty devastating thing. So there's the picture again with, of, the, of, of, of the people with their Nobel Prizes, and uh, he, he, here's what happened. These are all the people that left. And it's pretty staggering. By 1938, you were clearly uh, at, a, uh, at an impasse in, in taking nuclear physics forward. Rutherford then died in 1937, and they had to find a successor. Now, Although the famous discoveries in the Bell Prizes were in nuclear physics, the future areas were beginning to emerge in the laboratory by individual efforts. So we've got things like, for example, Appleton and the physics of the ionosphere, Kapitza in the Mond laboratory, leading to the discovery of superfluidity, sorry, superfluidity by Kapitza, Alan Misner, and Jones. We've got Burnell and the growth of crystallography, and Jeffrey Taylor in continuum and fluid mechanics. And these were to prove to be the seeds of the new physics that was going to be carried out after the Second World War. 
Now, just uh, looking at what was happening then, it, it happened that quite early, Bernal, in 1927, he was appointed a lecturer in structural crystallography and metallurgy, and then in 1931, the crystallography laboratory moved to the Cavendish laboratory. And his students included Helen McGaw, Dorothy Crowcroft, who became Dorothy Hodgkin, and Max Perutz. He, 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 the Bernal himself applied the techniques of crystallography to biological molecules. In particular, he resolved the pepsin molecule. Now, Perutz arrived in 1938, and he is undoubtedly one of the great heroes of this story, and published his first X-ray photographs of the hemoglobin model in 1938. And here is this very, very famous, famous picture showing the structure, showing the X-ray diffraction images of the hemoglobin atom. Now, <clears throat> Lawrence Prague was then appointed to succeed Rutherford as, uh, uh, in the laboratory. He had been the Langworthy Professor of Physics at Manchester, uh, which uh, he was the successor to Rutherford. And then in 1937, he was appointed director of the NPL, but had little taste for the, for the, the, the rather civil service rules and regulations with very little original science. In 1938, he accepted the Cavendish chair, and the editor of Nature commented that the Cavendish laboratory is now so large that no one man can control it all closely. And give Bragg's tact of gift of leadership from the best possible assurance of a happy cooperation of its many groups of research workers. This is, this is a key point in the whole story. Now, Bragg's appointment did not command universal acclaim. I am putting this very politely. There was a feeling that the laboratory had declined from the triumphant years of the early 1930s. Neville Mott, again the successor to Bragg, stated Bragg was offered the job by the electors, I have to assume, because they felt the Cavendish needed a new line. I know of a tendency at the time of the nuclear fraternity to feel and express the view that what isn't nuclear isn't fundamental physics. Would never happen now, would it? No, but, the, but there we are. This, this was a, a turning point in the story. Brian Pippard also makes the following statement. Bragg's appointment to the Cavendish Chair of Experimental Physics was taken by many as a threat to the great tradition of fundamental physics research established by J.J. Thompson and especially Rutherford. The choice of a crystallographer, however distinguished, was a blow to many hopes. So let's look at the regeneration. Bragg really faced a formidable set of challenges, but there is no doubt that in his much less flamboyant way, he foresaw how university physics research would develop in the future. The post-war years for Bragg were undoubtedly extremely difficult. In fact, if you look at his career, he made a move to Manchester, a move to Cambridge, a move to the Royal Institution, and every time he had to sort out messes left by his predecessors. That's basically what he said, and he did it brilliantly every time. We need more people like this. In the immediate post-war years, again, they, he had to take the laboratory in different directions. Ratcliffe, who was again his, his right-hand man throughout the whole of his time he was the professor, uh, understood Bragg's outstanding personal qualities, which enabled the necessary changes of direction to be made. And here's what he says, and it's, it's, it's really a beautiful statement. Bragg had the admirable gift of supporting people without running them. For example, Perutz and Kendrew, and he did the same thing with Ryle. Martin Rye was my supervisor, and he would not be run by anyone. Let me tell you that, right? Uh, it, 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 these are very, very dynamic people. Likewise, Perutz and Kendrew were extremely uh, dynamic individuals. But Bragg had the ability, as it says here, of, of not running them, but, did, but he, he supported them all the way through. So the management structure of the Cavendish had to change. Here's what Bragg says. 
The ideal research unit is one of six to 12 scientists and a few assistants together with one or more first class mechanics and a workshop in which the general run of apparatus can be constructed. By 1948, Bragg's reforms were in place, and the major groups in the laboratory were now, here they are here, the nuclear physics now being run by Frisch, but that was still on a serious de decline path. The radio group uh, was being uh, run by Radcliffe, but that soon evolved into the radio astronomy group. Low temperature physics in the Mond laboratory again was burgeoning. Crystallography now started up with a major way with following Bernal's work and then the appointment of a, a very distinguished crystallographer to the Cavendish chair. This was Bragg's home territory. Also very important is the group on, of metal, metal physics, which was run by Orowan, uh, who we'll see play a key role in the whole story we're going to tell. And then for the first time in the laboratory, we had mathematical physics. We had Hartree who came and devised the ways of using computers to do innovative theoretical work. So that's the way it started. There were others who were smaller groups, such as the fluid mechanics group that Jeffrey Taylor, G.I. Taylor, uh, worked in, but also he made the, a key uh, contribution to other understanding of dislocations in the mid 1930s, and that will also play a major role in, in this story. We had electron microscope. Again, that was another thing which was rather close to, um, to, uh, to Bragg's interest. And then later, the physics of chemistry of stars under Borden joined in 1958. So you're seeing the complete transformation of the laboratory from one where nuclear physics was absolutely dominant to what I've got much broader church that we see here. Other great innovations, senior staff now had their own offices, the groups had their own secretaries, support staff, they even had telephones. So it was a complete change in the way that research was done. For the first time, there was a laboratory secretary, first IT James and then Kenneth Dibton, and supported by nine clerical staff. So this is beginning to look like the, mo the modern style laboratory uh, that, uh, that, you, that we've all inherited. Now, here's Bragg's laboratory in 1949. And again, as I say, this has got most of the graduate students and the staff who are there. And you will recognize, again, on, on, on this picture, or, or, or lots of the good and great along the front row here. But I'm going to pick out on this picture the people who are key to the story we've got to understand uh, to, get, to get the story of the double helix. So uh, in the middle of the front row, we've got Bragg, Lawrence Bragg, and he really was supportive of this whole program very, very strongly. Next to him, uh, we, we've got uh, Will Taylor, who was the head of the crystallog crystallography group and absolutely key to, the in to uh, Br uh, Bragg's interests. Uh, then we've got here Max Perutz, who again, we'll hear a lot about Ritz. He's really a central person in the whole story. Uh, next, we've got uh, we've got Kendrew, who joined immediately after the war. We'll come back to all these people just in a moment. Uh, then we've got uh, uh, Bill Cochran, who actually did lots of the fundamental things that led to the understanding of the diffraction patterns uh, of the DNA molecule. Uh, and then we've got uh, June Broomfield, uh, here on the far left, this lady, one of the few ladies there, but her work was absolutely fundamental to the understanding the, the structure of the DNA molecules. And then finally, there's Francis Crick there. He joined the laboratory in 1949, aged 33. So he was a, quite a senior uh, person by the time he started doing his PhD studies. So these are the people, and you will see it forms a reasonable group within the, the science of the laboratory, but all of the other groups are going to make contributions uh, to the story. Now, Bragg continued to be very ambivalent about nuclear physics because he believed the experiments were becoming so large, they had to be national rather than what could be contained within a laboratory. But his real enthusiasm is for the new sciences which are developing, particularly crystallography, biological physics, electron microscopy, condensed matter physics, and radio astronomy. Now, in their different ways, many of them were related to Bragg's very deep interests in optical and x-ray systems, 
in particular the problems of phase determination and the application of Fourier optics. These were the things which were very, very close to his heart. And in particular, just to give you one example, in the, in the case of the DNA molecule, getting the phases to be able to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure is not so different from preserving phase in radio astronomy aperture synthesis. In both cases, you're trying to get the phase relationships between the observations. These were all greatly advanced by the first generation of the electronic computers. These are the descendants of Erwin Williams' scale of two counter of 1928. And in particular, the EDSAC computer, by, which was developed by Morris, Morris Wilkes and his colleagues in the computer laboratory, were to prove vital to the success of these new sciences. So by what I'm painting a, a picture is of lots of the things which are absolutely necessary to be able to make progress on the DNA story were just in their, nest, their infancy when the whole story started. Now, as I said, Bragg uh, was fortunate to attract his former student and colleague, Will Taylor, who had been head of physics in Manchester College of Science and Technology to take up a readership in crystallography. And he became the head of the crystallography group. Among the skeptics, crystallography was scarcely regarded as part of physics. But Bragg was quite clear about the fundamental significance of the physics of matter. He says, the department which we call crystallography would perhaps be better described as the department for discovery of the structure of the solid state. Mainly by x-rays, we seek to discover the way the atoms are arranged in crystals and in other forms of solids. And then in a throwaway line, he goes on, the scope of the work is very considerable. At the one end, we are investigating such substances as minerals and alloys in the inorganic field. Other researchers are examining complex organic compounds. And finally, at the other extreme, we have a little group, which is financed by the Medical Research Council under the direction of Perutz, which is engaged in a gallant attempt to work out the structure of the highly complex molecules which build up living matter, the proteins. So that is the way in which the, the molecular biology began to grow in the Cavendish laboratory. John Kendrew joined in January 1946. He was a chemist and joined the, the enterprise under, uh, under Perutz uh, on the structures of proteins. But none of them really realized when they took it on what terrible problem it was. It really was a significantly very, very difficult problem indeed. But anyway, Bragg, Bragg managed to persuade the Medical Research Council to set up the MRC unit for the study of the molecular structure of biological systems. What happened was he went down and, and made a presentation to them and instantly they, they approved it, much to his surprise. Happy days. So uh, that is how uh, this little group uh, developed very, very, very quickly. The group drew, drew steadily with the rivals of, here, 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 here are all the names. We've got here Hugh Huxley, 1948, Francis Crick, 1949, James Watson, 1951, Vernon Ingram, 1954, and David Blue in 1954. There's a terrific set of brilliant scientists who joined the enterprise at that time. So that's more or less my introduction to how we start and go. And now we've got to get into the details of how, they, how it was done. Now, I, I, I got to thank Archie High, uh, who was meaning to be here tonight, but I believe he will be watching me online. He brought to my notice certain key factors which I had not known about, which explained what happened. Now, in 1934, G.I. Taylor and Egon Oravon, they did the seminal work on identifying the dislocations in solids, which give them their strength and, and so on. Again, that's another story. But in particular, there are two types of dislocations, the edge, dis, uh, the, 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 the edge uh, and the screw dislocations. Here's an edge one, here's a screw one. And you can see that the screw dislocation has got essentially a sort of helical form. In 1949, Arthur Wilson published a paper entitled Diffraction by a Screw Dislocation. This was a study of X-ray scattering in helical structures. 
He thanks Orwin for his encouragement and participation in that because he was part of one of the founders of these dislocations. And in fact, that worked a bit on unpublished earlier work by Alexander Stokes, which was also acknowledged by Wilson in his pioneering work. So that meant that even in, by 1949, Again, from a completely different area, we're finding the way in which what the X-ray diffraction patterns of helices ought to be. Now, Bill Cochran is another of the, uh, the great heroes of the story. Um, he did many, many different things, but he, among the ones for this story, the isomorphic substitution uh, in his PhD decision of 1947 was a way of solving the phase problem. What you do there is to substitute one of the uh, one of the atoms by a similar isomorphic one. So, for example, going from bromine to iodine, I just use that. That's the little chemistry I know. Um, you do, by that means, you can actually resolve what the phases are of the uh, of the X-ray uh, diffraction patterns. He applied these successfully to to sucrose as he said here, enabling the location in particular of the hydrogen atoms to be determined. And these were the techniques that were going to be developed by Perutz, Kendrew, and, and, uh, and, and Crick. Now, uh, Bill Cochran, uh, whom, whom I, I, I knew when, when, when I was in Edinburgh, he became, he became professor of natural philosophy. He is notable for having made key advances which resulted in Nobel Prizes for three other groups of people. So obviously we're going to talk about the Watson and Crick for, uh, for DNA, the Carl and Hauptmann in 1985 for direct methods of determination crystal structure, and Brockhaus in 1994 for neutron diffraction techniques and lattice dynamic. That's, that's good going, it's jolly good going. So uh, Babul was a key fan, and we'll look at the results of his papers just in a moment. Now, uh, the, ne the next person is June, June uh, Broomhead. She was awarded a PhD research student in 1946 to work with Will Taylor. She was one of very few women in the laboratory at this time, but she was clearly a, a brilliant scientist. She was the person who de determined the dimensions of two of the key bases in the structure of the DNA molecule. She determined the sizes and shapes of the adenine and thiamine in 1940 and 1951 for the DNA molecule by X-ray methods. And she also made this prescient statement. Hydrogen bonds linking the purine molecule to chlorine atoms and to water molecules and short van der Waal force contacts with other purine molecules lie approximately in the plane of the molecule. Now, that's, I, that's absolutely fundamental to actually what was going to be done later by Watson's brilliant discovery of the base pairings. And what we've got here in this picture is on that side, uh, we've got the, uh, the adenine molecule, there are the hydrogen bonds, and here is the, here is the thymine uh, mo molecule on the right. So she actually provided that essential data that was needed in the reconstruction of what the, what, what the chain was like. She moved to Oxford in, in, with, to work with uh, Dorothy Hodgkin on vitamin B12, and then moved to Ottawa with her Canadian husband, George Lindsay, who was also on that photograph on which, in which she, she, she appeared. She went there and identified the crystal structure of codeine. So she is a seriously important uh, lady whom, who, who we ought to celebrate. In 1952, when she had moved to, 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 to Canada, Brack wrote a rather touching letter to her. We badly need your hands to tackle naughty crystallographic programs, both experimental and theoretical. I wish all these things had come up while you were still with us. They would have been just in your line. So it just, that's how things happen. Now, uh, Rosalind Franklin, of course, is a major player in this whole story, and I'm not going to go through any ideas. I simply want to draw out one or two points about her, the, her career and interactions, which are going to play into the story later. Now, first of all, uh, she was a physical chemist who used X-ray diffraction rather than crystallography in her studies of DNA. 
And that was going to be a bit of a problem for her because although she could brilliantly analyze the diffraction patterns, one needed an understanding of crystallography to understand it, uh, further things, which was understood by Craig, uh, as we'll see later. She arrived at King's College in January 1951, and Ma Morris Wilkins, the head of the group, handed over the studies of DNA to her and her student, Raymond Gosling. Now, what Raymond, Aaron Krug has written about the arrangement to made was the following. There was an unfortunate ambiguity about the respective positions of Wilkins and Franklin, which later led to dissension between them about the demarcation of the DNA research at King's. That was very unfortunate. It was actually the way in which the grant was awarded that the, it wasn't made clear who was running the show in the DNA studies. And that was the source of, of, of a bit of unhappiness. Morris Wilkins uh, learned about greatly improved techniques devised by Rudolf Singer at Bern for extracting long unbroken strands of DNA. He found a way of creating uniform long strands from a viscous solution of the DNA molecules. The resulting X-ray diffraction patterns were to excite Watson when he saw them presented at a Naples conference in May 1951. Now, what Franklin now did was really absolutely brilliant. She assembled a fine focus X-ray tube, which produced much sharper images than those used by, by Wilkins. She also had the technical skills to create much thinner long strands of the DNA molecules, which was also a key contribution to getting high resolution and sharpness in the X-ray diffraction images. So here is, here is what that means. What we've got on the left here is the picture which Wilkins showed in Naples in May 1951. And this is just all of the, this is just taking straight uh, x-ray uh, um, diffraction patterns uh, as, the, as they were. On the right, we've got the two images from Franklin and Gosling's work. And you can see uh, this picture here is again, the improved version of the one showed by Wilkins. It's absolutely fantastic. You can see the sharpness of the blob, you can measure the intensities accurately and everything else. But even more important, what they showed was that the image you got depended upon the humidity of the, uh, of the, uh, of the environment. So if you had less than 75% humidity, you got this, what they called the A form of the molecule. If you had greater than 75%, you've got this B form, which looks like this, uh, quite different. Now, what the problem was that before that, the recognition of the importance of humidity, the images were a mixture of the two, rather than, again, them, them separately. Well, at last we got to Watson and Crick. Um, well, they were interesting people. Uh, I'm just going to quote without comment from Max Perutz uh, af long after these events. They shared the sublime, sublime arrogance of men who have rarely met their intellectual equals. To say that they did not suffer fools gladly would be an understatement. Uh, Crick's comments would hit out like daggers at non secretaries and Watson demonstratively unfolded his new paper at seminars that bored him. Well, there we are. I, I make no comment. These are the people that we're dealing with. The word, I think, arrogance may not be too strong a word to use, use in this case. So there they are in their office in, in the Austin wing. They were located on the on on the second floor uh, of the Austin wing with with other th uh, with the rest the rest of the group. So uh, they, they were quite difficult difficult characters. Uh, here's just another example uh, from uh, Crick's biographical memoir. Uh, I have the pleasure of being the uh, editor in chief of the biographical memoirs of Fellows of the Royal Society and had to deal with the, with Crick's biographical memoir. Here is the postcard that we've published from. 
Creek from the MRC Laboratory from Dr. Creek. Thanks you for your letter. But regrets he is unable to accept your kind invitation to send an autograph, provide a photograph, cure your disease, be interviewed, talk on the radio, appear on TV, speak after dinner, give a testimonial, help you in your project, read your manuscript, deliver a lecture, attend a conference, act as chairman, become an editor, contribute an article, write an article, accept your honorary degree. <coughs> well, it's all part of the characters that, we, uh, that, we, that we're, we, we're dealing with. Now, the helices had been introduced into biology since the 1930s, and Bragg was very strongly attracted to the idea that the helical start of protons, which had been suggested by Huggins in 1943, was what we should be studying. He hadn't specifically in mind what is termed the alpha helix for unstretched proteins. If you stretch them, they're called beta helixes. And so these, this was an example uh, from, again, the study of actually uh, sheep's hairs. In 1950, this is a key part of the story. In 1950, Bragg, Prutz, and Kendra attempted to find such a chemical structures uh, involving, involving helices, but failed. And then to Bragg's chagrin, Linus Pollen found a solution a year later. As Bragg wrote in 1965, I've always regarded this paper as the most ill-planned and abortive in which I have ever been involved. He had asked the right question, and it had been scooped by Pauling. So he was not best pleased. Now, in his gentlemanly way, Bragg did not want to enter into competition with Wilkins, whose group at King's College were well ahead of the Cambridge group in DNA studies. Franklin and Gostin's outstanding X-ray days on their own did not provide information about the structure of the molecule. So Bragg asked Bill Cochran to carry out theoretical calculations of the X-ray diffraction pattern of thin molecular heresis. Then in collaboration with Vladimir Vand, who'd already considered the case of uniform his, and with Crick, who elbowed his way into these calculations as a distraction from his PhD program, the analysis was carried out in October 1951. These calculations show that the X-ray spectra of helices lie on a series of what they call ley lines, and also with all the extra atoms at the top produce these dots there, uh, which are the, the maxim. These are characteristic features of diffraction by helix. And so if I just flat flick back one or two slides uh, to here, there you see in the right hand one, there are the ley lines on the on the B form. And this is the form which happened, which occurs in 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 life forms. So there it was absolutely clear that this was what you were dealing with. So from that, they were able to deduce the, the, all the properties of the helix and the calculations of Cochrane, Creek, and Venn for, uh, for the two cases of two identical helices included the interference between the two sets of the scattered waves. And so the bases gave rise to, to ley lines, and the spectra of the bases formed the dark areas at the top and bottom of the X-ray pictures. I won't go back to it. But what it meant is you were able then to interpret uh, not only the overall structure, but the more detailed uh, aspects of the, uh, of the atomic distribution. In November of 1951, Franklin described the two forms of DNA at a colloquium in London, which was attended by Watson. He and Crick concluded that the molecule had to have a helical structure, as we've seen why it was. Relying on Watson's, and I've called here, faulty recollections of the talk, they produced a triple standard model of DNA in which the phosphate groups were on the inside and the bases pointing outwards, and they published it. On a brief, sorry, I take that back, I, I, I think that may not be the case. On a brief visit to Cambridge then, Wilkins and Franklin quickly dismissed the models since they didn't have any water molecules. And what had happened is Watson had misunderstood. He misunderstood what the contents of the unit cell, cell were. Now, Bragg was absolutely incensed that Watson and Crick had attempted to elbow their way in the province of King's College group. What made his matters worse was that they'd come up with an incorrect model. So that that's a way to become really unpopular. 
So Bragg then instructed them to discontinue their studies of DNA. He was very unhappy. In autumn 1952, the Cavendish group learned that Pauling was working on the structure of DNA and DNA. And as soon as Bragg learned that Pauling was taking up the challenge, he released Crick and Watson uh, from their ban in order to, again, uh, to, to return to the work on DNA. Bragg did not want to be scooped by Pauling yet again. This was revenge for, for what had happened before. Pauling's paper on the triple-stranded model for the molecule was similar to the abortive tape by Crick and Watson. As soon as the manuscript of Pauling's paper arrived in Cambridge in January 1953, Watson recognized that the model was chemically impossible, coming from the greatest chemist of his time, but was concerned that as the world's leading chemist, Pauling would soon find his mistake. In November 1952, a report by Franklin and Gosling was handed to Crick, which contained new crystalline allographic data on the A form of DNA. It stated that the lattice was monoclinic face-centered, the space group was C2, and gave the dimensions of the unit cell. Among all of these in Cambridge you were studying, only Crick realized that the C2 space group implied a dyad that is a twofold axis of symmetry in which the two sugar phosphate chains run in opposite directions. In other words, they're anti-parallel. So one was getting very close now to getting the, the, the basis of what the molecules were about. With these clues, Crick and Watson devoted all their en considerable energies to unraveling the structure of DNA molecule. Here, the computations of Cochrane, Crick, and Van came into their own, since these were the tools that were needed to interpret Franklin's images. The final piece of information was provided by Jerry Donoghue, who was working in the same office as Crick and Watson in the Austin wing. He pointed out that Watson had used the wrong tautomeric forms for the basis. He should have used the keto form, which, use, which Donoghue said was the common one, rather than the enum, enol form, which is what was said to be the case in the textbooks. So that, again, was a key part of the whole story. On the morning of 20th February 1953, Watson came up with a crucial finding that the pairing of adenine with thiamine and cytosine with guanine, each pair joined by hydrogen bonds, that each of these pairs had exactly the same length and fitted perfectly between the helical backbone. These pairings accounted for Chargaff's rule of 1950 that the DNA comprised equal quantities of adenines and thymines, and also separately of cytosines and guanine. At lunch that same day in the Eagle Pub in Bennett Street, Crick and Watson announced to all present they had found the secret of life. Crick told his wife later that evening about the discovery. Years, years later, she told him she had not believed a word of it, remarking, you were always coming home and saying things like that. <laughs> well, uh, the, 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 there's the picture of what happened. You joined together them by hydrogen bonds, thymine, adenine, cytosine, and the, uh, gu guanine. And these are, I've got exactly the same size, which fit perfectly between the two uh, helices on the outside. And here's the, the original half side Crick's and Watson one that we've got in the, in the laboratory uh, showing double helix structure with the, with the base pairs, again, joint holding them together. The discovery of the, the structure of DNA molecule and the data on which it was based were published in three consecutive articles in the, uh, in the 25th April 1953 edition of Nature. The Watson and Crick paper concludes with the famous remark, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Now, Aaron Klug has pointed out that the uncharacteristic cautious statement, this is really very cautious for Watson and Crick, let me assure you, saying that the cautious statement it was because they hadn't seen the King's College papers before they were published. So they hadn't, didn't know what they were going to be saying. The papers are there back to back in the same copy of nature, and yet they hadn't seen them. Now, again, 
it's interesting that in that first paper by Watson and Craig, there's no mention of all the heroes that I've mentioned in this lecture. It's entirely about just how you fit things together. They were slightly more generous in their future paper once they'd seen their uh, uh, other papers. And that was, again, fully explored in this paper here on the 30th of May in 1953, the genetical implication of the structure of deoxyribonucleic nucleic acid. And when they did again the analysis of the of the of what was being shown in these papers, they got an excellent uh, match to the X-ray diffraction patterns. Well, the subsequent uh, story is is well known. Tragically, Franklin died of ovarian cancer in 1958 at the age of only 37. She was clearly a quite outstanding scientist. The Nobel prizes were awarded to Crick, Watson, and Wilkins in 1962. So by 1963, 1953, when, um, um, when Bragg became the director of the Royal Institution, he could be justly proud of his achievements as Cavendish professor. Again, just the, the year he was about to move, the structure of DNA was sold. Radio strong was blossoming under Ryle, low temperature physics was the frontier of research, and electron microscopy was adding completely new dimensions to the study of condensed matter physics. The management structure of the laboratory had evolved from a monolithic ent entity to a group structure which allowed the individual groups to determine their own priorities for research with the encouraging light touch uh, from Bragg. Well, uh, just to, 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 to complete the story, what happened next uh, after the discovery? Neville Mott was appointed Cavendish professor to Sig Bragg in 1954, and that resulted in further changes in the scientific direction of the laboratory. He was unquestionably the leading UK theorist in solid state at the time, and he was, he was con to consolidate and expand considerably both theory and experiment in the lab. The success of Watson and Crick in dis disentangling the structure of DNA molecule was undoubtedly a real triumph. At the same time, Kendrew and Perutz were on the brink of determining the structures of myoglobin and hemoglobin after all this time, 20, 20, 20 years since the first diffraction pattern, uh, finally Perutz cracked it. But there was increasing demand for space and resources within the laboratory. And there was also the problem that the MRC unit was a pure research organization dedicated to molecular biology with staff of the highest caliber who did not teach, or in the case of Craig, refused to teach, and whose research students were ill-prepared to work in a physics laboratory. The MRC unit, despite its undoubted distinction, was a burden on the laboratory. At the same time, the number of students admitted by the colleges to read physics was continuing to increase with a corresponding increase in the teaching staff. So in the summer of 1957, the MRC unit was decanted in what became known as the MRC hut on beside the, again, the, the, the Austin wing. So there's, uh, there's the Austin wing there uh, where they were uh, doing their expanse before. They were decanted into that hut, the MRC hut. And it was there that uh, Kendrew and Perutz again dissolved the structures of myoglobin and hemoglobin. It, 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 it was meant to be uh, it, it was meant to be pulled down, and, but actually at least it was only pulled down a couple of years ago when they cleared out that site and it did. So with the tremendous success of the program, the molecular biologists continued to expand exponentially in numbers. Roots and Craig made the case to the Medical Research Council that a new accommodation was needed, and in 1958, the MRC grew the foundation of the MRC Laboratory for Molecular Biology. In his autobiography, here, here's what Mott wrote, I judged that they would develop into a bigger thing than we could cope with, and encouraged the general board to find them a new site. And then in parenthesis, J.G. Crowther's book on the Cavendish says, I was very sad when they left, but that was not so. <laughs> <laughs> the space they left enabled me to build up electromicroscopy and develop work on dislocations. 
Well, as everyone knows, the MRC Laboratory for Molecular Biology has been a fantastic success. And here is the list of Nobel Prize winners, uh, which have be, gone through that new building. And of course, they've got their wonderful new laboratory now. So uh, th that, that, that's where I, I'm, go I'm going to stop. But the one thing which I had not appreciated when I began preparing this lecture was in fact that there were contributions from all the new groups to understanding how you could analyze the date from, from, from molecular biology and so forth. So we've got metal physics, we've got, uh, we've got, got electron microscopy, we've got crystallography, everything. All of them are pitching in and all of them were done, were making their contributions. And, all, and also the other thing was that it, it really helped. It, uh, one ask this question, why did this happen in Cambridge? And I think the answer is now clear to me at least, and that is that all the component parts needed to f understand all of these data were there in the laboratory, but in, not in the guises that we would recognize them now. So it's, uh, I, I thank you very much for, for, for twisting my arm to give this lecture because I've learned a lot. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Malcolm, thank you very much. I think we all have learned a lot. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure there'll be some questions, but let, let, let me sort of start. The, 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 the story you tell is, is one where it's the sort of accidents of um, different activities going actually in different directions, perhaps being driven by apparently different uh, end goals, and yet a sort of overlap that allowed magic to happen um i i with the exception of the mrc lab the um, lmb lab uh, where the groups sort of became more isolated after they had sort of outgrown them become their own entities i'm not convinced they find it so easy to be so creative well that list in front of you shows it didn't do too badly in getting it off the lmb was the exception but 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 but, but looking at and, and of course that was not a university department right right you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think I would rather not even attempt an answer. I, I think it would be complicated uh, to, to know what actually happened. This was this period of time from the from 1950 really to 1960 was, was fantastic. And I think that one couldn't have predicted that that sort of symbiosis would occur but, between these separate but groups. that story about the link between the helical structure of the screw dislocation and the structure of DNA, I hadn't heard before. I mean, it's it's beautiful, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yes. Hi, thank you very much indeed. Very interesting. I, I, I knew about the different work between Franklin and Crick and Watson, but I didn't know about the other female uh, researcher who also did work on x-rays. Yes. And what occurred to me today and in the past is that this very careful kind of laboratory work done by two women, and then this kind of egocentric, arrogant work done by two males. I, I wondered whether this, whether in other fields of science, the, you uh, other breakthroughs have this same sort of um, two sides of, of one group of people doing uh, uh, very sort of quiet, methodical work and other people doing kind of uh, breakthrough visionary work. And whether you thought there was any gender uh, relations or it, it just happened to be that way at that time. Um, I, I think my, my own uh, take on this is that not nearly enough credit is given to the people who produce the data on which this could be actually built. And it, it, it really is shocking that all the hard work was being done by extremely good experimentalists. Both Crick and Watson were entirely theorists, you know, with the, with, with the, with the characteristics you defined. There is are plenty of other examples in, in the time that I've, I've been covering where the same sort of thing happened. I was Martin Ryle's student, and the, the Hoyle Ryle was absolutely very interesting. Uh, <laughs> I was the piggy in the middle because I was in good terms with both of them as a graduate student. Uh, but again, these very strong, strongly held views. On the one side, you've got the theorist Hoyle, and you've got Martin Ryle, who was actually creating the telescopes and the techniques which led the world for 20 years. 
and Martin was very was very reluctant to let any of the theorists see his results because he knew they would write a poor paper paper overnight and, and post it off as if that's that's the answer to everything where the sweat and blood and tears to make these experiments work would would vanish so I feel passionately about this that we've got to you know make sure that all the experimenters get the credit for providing that which is done by I'm not disagree they're extremely bright and driven theorists but we've got to get the balance right. I don't know if you agree, Richard. Um, I, I absolutely agree. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, um, but, 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 but it is also the case that, um, with few exceptions, most uh, most Nobel Prizes are awarded for discoveries in the laboratory, when I mean, others might have managed to get in and sort of get claim the credit, which is um, that's probably overstating it. But the the Crick and Watson story is on the back of discoveries in the laboratory without the x-ray pictures there would have been nothing yes and the so so that's it isn't sort of sitting in, well einstein might be the exception but almost everything else is through careful observation uh melvin excellent uh, and enthusiastic as always uh I, I know it's a minor point that you might not know the answer to but did anything come of the project that Crick and Watson was supposed to be working on? <laughs> well, what he was meant to be working on uh, was, was solving myoglobin and hemoglobin, uh, so which again was what, what, what he was working with Perutz. So, uh, so the, the answer, that's what actually was solved by 1962. Uh, by then, of course, he'd, he'd gone on to different, to, to, to different things. But, uh, well, I think that's so. But the sort of, I mean, the, the the piece of information that I read, I, 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 Malcolm, I'm sure you can correct me, is that it took uh, Kandra and Perutz 13 years to get to the structure of hemoglobin. 20 years. 20? Yes. Okay. Um, and the MRC remained completely supportive. Correct. Without a good result. It's unthinkable in today's world, isn't it? I mean, think, thinking about your sort of conditions for what matters, uh, uh, how, how can one spend so long? Well, they, they, they were making gradual progress all the yes. way through. Yes. But the final, you're talking about 52,000 atoms yeah. in, in the, in the mm -hmm. hemoglobin atom and where they all sit in this structure. It's, it's, it was a, it's, a, it's a fantastically brilliant analysis. That they made. But it was done by, by again, in increasingly improving the power of the of the x-ray tubes and everything else there's lots of developments going along all the way so it was all the, the, the analogy i like is the gravitational wave experiments which is very close mm. to, to my heart and, and, and mm. people's people's heart you know the really clever thing was to continue the funding knowing that it would take you 15 years to get down to the sensitivity where you had a good chance of, of measuring it and on a real on a real occasion the again the, 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 the national the, the US funding body actually agreed to continue doing that for 15 years without knowing that they wouldn't get a result for a long time. That's an uplifting recent example. Yes, uh, it, it doesn't feel like that most of the time, though, does it? Exactly, it doesn't. Yeah. Right now. Yes. But further questions? Thank you. I wonder what the proportion of negative results to these wonderful positive results actually is, and whether in the sorry, I wonder if the proportion of negative results to positive results um, in these wonderful examples um, is something that couldn't happen today. Um, I think the answer is that all of us know that we have many more failures than successes in absolutely everything that we do, whether it's theory or it's, it's experiment or anything else. And uh, you, you, know, uh, you know when you've done a Duff experiment and it's got nothing, and, and then you go and do another one. And a, a good example is the, the discovery of the neutron. The neutron was first postulated by Rutherford in 1920, and it was 1932 before it was actually discovered by, uh, by Chadwick. But in that intervening period, in, in, in Chadwick's writings, he says, you know, we tried 
utterly outlandish ideas or ways of trying to discover the neutral, all of which collapsed and didn't work. And you know, that's not uh, that, that's not an unfamiliar pattern of the way that some areas of research you, you it, it was just such a tough one. And then the, the really amazing thing is that once he got got the clues from the French uh, scientists uh, work, he actually worked flat out for three works, weeks and completely solved the whole problem, getting neutrons from a whole range of, of atoms and, and completely you know, tied up the whole business. It was a fantastic thing. So, you know, it happens. Fantastic lecture, Mark. I'm really pleased I twisted your arm. Oh, thank uh, you. Yes. Um, I just have one comment, which is about uh, someone I'd never heard of before, Jerry Donahue, yes. who provided another one of the keys. Yes. And it's a tribute to multidisciplinary work, to working across your boundaries. Exactly. Um, which I th thought is always extremely important. If you want to do something new in science, talk to someone new. Well, I wrote in my editorial for Biographical Memoirs, the last one, about uh, interdisciplinary research, which we are meant to do, right? And we've been doing it since the beginning of blooming science. You know, everything is dead interdisciplinary in one way or another. And I'm sure that uh, Richard agrees. Well, well I, 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 yes, we could have quite a few conversations. Uh, yes, exactly, well, yes. This. yes. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I think it requires quite I mean, it does require leadership. Um, yes. I mean, tolerating stuff that doesn't quite fit is uh, something we have to learn how to do. It's part of the game. Um, and if if everyone around you is, uh, it feels like you, then something's wrong. Exactly. Yeah. You know. well, I think this is where I think Bragg's role in the whole of this yes. is absolutely crucial because he was able to make these people, in a sense, come together in a gentle way without forcing them together, just letting it happen naturally, but with positive encouragement. You know, this is the, this is the ideal way to run a laboratory. I think he did a fantastic job. Is that a good moment, unless anyone has a last word, to thank Malcolm for a brilliant lecture. I, 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 we, we learned a lot. And, and, Very kind. And, and, uh, it's not just the history, it's the it's the way you've drawn out the, the sort of magic of these. It is magic. It's total magic. Semi-chance, but actually sort of programmed uh, interactions. It's what I tell the students. They never believe me when I say, there is fantastic beauty in physics. Fantastic beauty. And the DNA molecule is... Well, we could probably just call it science rather than being partisan. But... Oh, are we partisan? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We, we have to be careful. Uh, I mean, it, it happened to, to take place in physics. Yes. It didn't have to. It um, didn't but, have to. but it was that magic set of conditions that, that made, it made it happen. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>